What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rivardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. And the New York Giants just wrapped some of their OTA practices, moving into mandatory minicamp next week. That should be really interesting. We've got some updates on Darren Waller's future, but for the primary topic of today's episode, we want to talk about the play caller situation that's starting to take shape at OTAs, according to Jordan Rannon of ESPN. All signs point to Brian Dable taking over as the offensive play caller this upcoming season. Brian Dable was asked about it during OTAs last week and kind of mentioned it's something that he's practicing. He's preparing for it. It's something he's been considering all offseason. And that OTAs for these practices, he has been calling the plays. And he's going to decide after training camp whether or not he's going to do that in the regular season. So we kind of want to unpack that and discuss, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? What do we think this means for the team if Brian Dable does take over as the play caller? And whether or not we think that he should. Spoiler alert, I think he absolutely should. But we'll go ahead and unpack the reasoning behind that and talk a little bit about Darren Waller and his rap career. But before we dive into all that, make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you're listening to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, Alex, how are you doing today, my friend? And how are you feeling about Darren Waller's budding new rap career? <laughs> well... Do the Giants ever have a normal offseason? Absolutely not. Whether it be Kadarius Tony or whether it be anything in season, I mean, the latest saga is Don Waller rapping his way off the Giants. Um, that's a new one. Uh, look, his music's not for me. Too much auto tune. Best of luck to him in his career. I fully support anyone trying to, you know, show their emotions and display their emotions through music, even if it's not necessarily good music. Um, but I will say this. Interesting development there. Darren Waller, the, mo the best thing he can do is give us $11.6 million back because it's going to be a post-June 1st retirement. Um, and listen, $11.6 million. This is another episode I do want to have, Anthony, in the next couple couple days. What do you do with that money? You know, where does that money go? Uh, what's the options right now? I'm looking at the secondary, cornerbacks, veterans. You know, what options are there? I think we'll break down all those guys down in a future episode just because I think the Giants should throw a little bit of money at a veteran. They have way too much inexperience in the secondary to actually hold up. So I think they will do that. It's just a matter of who. Um, but looking at the offense right now, I mean, Justin Jefferson just got a $35 million per season contract over four years. Um, now, we know that the Minnesota Vikings tried to trade up to actually get Malik Neighbors. Why? Did they really want Jordan Addison, Malik Neighbors, and Justin Jefferson? I think they probably were willing to trade Jordan Addison plus a pick to get Neighbors. Um, then, you know, Neighbors and uh, J Justin Jefferson, that's the best receiver core in football. And it's not even close, really. Um, I think that would have been pretty cool for the Vikings. However, they end up not doing that. The Giants get Neighbors. And you're going to see how important it is to have a, a young WR1 on a very, very uh, cost-efficient contract, right? Neighbors is making a maximum, I think actually slightly under $10 million per season on average over the next four years, not to mention his fifth year option. That money, guys, $25 million differential, if not more, between him and Justin Jefferson. Now, fair to mention, Neighbors has not done anything in the NFL yet. Justin Jefferson is a bona fide superstar. He is a proven commodity. Uh, we think Neighbors can be that. Just have to get him the football. The offensive line quarterback play have to hold up. Uh, with that being said, Getting him the football is part of the scheme, part of the strategy here for Brian Dable. It seems as though it's just a matter of time before they announce he's going to be calling plays. Why is he calling plays? Well, he's got to go down with the freaking ship. You know what I mean? Um, if you're Brian Dable and you watch Mike Kafka, you know, develop the play calling system in 2022... Um, it was solid. They managed to work around Daniel Jones' uh, inefficiencies, and then they transition, obviously, to 2023. Daniel Jones gets hurt. He's not very good to start the year. They figure out how to stop him and basically just take away his first read, force him to run. Um, and, the, and then they would just have someone covering those B gaps and, and basically just uh, stifling any opportunity for him. So, you know, yardage, obviously, regressed. Um, defense has figured out how to stop him. If he can't get past his first read, he's basically half of a player. That's been the entire con about Daniel Jones. And guys, like, this is not just me saying this. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that want to see what Daniel Jones can do. This is not about, this is not a Daniel Jones episode per se, but it does obviously incorporate him because of the play calling. He struggles very much getting past his first read. Um, that is a very big problem for quarterbacks in the NFL. If you cannot get past your first progression, you are going to be a bad player ultimately. So the main developmental thing for Daniel Jones this year, not running, you know, not throwing, uh, it's getting through his uh, progressions 
efficiently and being able to get to those second, third receivers. What's the use of having Jalen Hyatt, Darius Slayton, Wandell Robinson, or Theo Johnson if you can't actually get to them because neighbors, you're locked in, your eyes are locked in. I mean, I remember Tariq Woolen saying, we knew he was going to stare down his receiver, pick six on the two-yard line. Um, so, like, you know, other players are saying it. We've seen it. The film says it. Anthony, how do you think Brian Dable works around Daniel Jones's difficulty moving through his progressions? This is not an offensive line thing. Even when the line has been clean, he struggled with this. How do you think you work around that problem? Because it is a legitimate problem, and it is something the Giants are going to have to find a way uh, to beat. Sure, it is a problem that we've seen in the past. I will say that Daniel Jones, it's not that he doesn't have the ability to work through his progressions, go through all of his reads. It's just that he lacks consistency in doing so. I remember when he was a rookie working in Pat Schirmer's system, there was a touchdown pass to win Gallman against the Washington uh, Commanders uh, at home that season, his rookie year. And I was at that game and I remember they were on the goal line and Daniel Jones went through four reads before finding Gallman for the touchdown on the goal line. So we'd like, we've seen him glimpses of this in the past, right? Like we've seen him go through his progressions and make the right read, but it's consistency. Getting him to do it consistently has been the problem. And what Brian Dable can do to create more consistency in that regard is create plays with less reads. So one, two read ball is out one, two, three quick reads ball is out or having more hot reads built into the system rpos i don't think the giants have ran enough rpos which is a run pass option right daniel jones has the ability to hand it off to devin singletary or pull it boom slant route open right there and basically you're reading one defender and deciding whether you are running or throwing the football this is something that the philadelphia eagles do a whole lot that has optimized their offensive output and created a an offense for J jalen hurts that's allowed him to develop into one of the best quarterbacks in the nfl but meanwhile playing in a very simplistic offense that asks him to make about one read per pass. And that's what the Giants need to do more of. And for what it's worth, that's something Brian Dable is familiar with. If you look back on the Buffalo Bills offense that he used to run, there was a lot of RPOs. There were a lot of quick passing opportunities for Josh Allen. And he was able to get the ball out of his hands quickly and prevent the pass rush from getting there. And I think that Brian Dable could do a good job with that. So when you ask me how does he mitigate the slow processing of Daniel Jones necessarily, Less reads. Don't ask him to read the whole field all the time. Give him more quick passing opportunities in that RPO style offense. And for what it's worth even further, Brian Dable in the past has taken playbooks, shredded them apart, and redid them. That's what he did with Josh Allen in the early portion of his career. Took it, dismantled it, and only catered to the strengths of Josh Allen and went from there. So if the Giants feel like their playbook doesn't include enough RPOs right now, Brian Dable won't hesitate to redo the entire thing and make it RPO heavy if he feels that's the way to optimize Daniel Jones's abilities and mitigate some of his weaknesses. So I think that's one of the best solutions there. But one of the kind of drawbacks of having Mike Kafka as the offensive coordinator these past couple seasons, Alex, I feel like there's been an inconsistent balance to the Giants offense. Some drives, they want to run the ball every single play. Others, they forget about the running game, even if it's working for them. And I think that Brian Dable, that's where he can step in and fix this offense offense, create a more consistent balance. How do you feel about that, Alex, creating more balance in the offensive attack here with both the rushing and the passing? You know, there actually is a uh, quarterback that comes to mind when I think about what the Giants may look to do, um, and it's Tua. And why Tua? Because he gets the ball out really fast. A lot of RPOs, really athletic backfield. I like the fact that they go and get like a guy like uh, Tyrone Tracy, who may not be like David Achain fast, but has the ability to break tackles, make, make guys miss, and pick up extra yards. And then you go get Neighbors, who is like a straight-up elite athlete, um, not to mention Wando Robinson and his short area quickness. So, you know, Jalen Hyatt has the elite speed. Darius Lane has the elite speed. I like the fact that the Giants are adding guys that have a couple of elite athletic traits. And I think that they can take a playbook out of Miami's uh, offense and say to themselves, well, let's get the ball outside to those crack blocks on the outside. We know that Carmen Brasilla loves that. Um, we know that that's going to be probably a staple in this offense moving forward. And look, the Dolphins just get the ball out quickly and they scheme their playmakers open. You have Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill. Things get pretty easy for you. Raheem Mostert was no joke last year either. Um, the Giants have a guy like Neighbors who has that elite speed. They have Wandale who can be that Jalen Hyatt kind of de facto player. It's not the same, obviously. Hyatt, uh, Waddle's better. Um, but Wandale can be very, very productive in his own right. So, you know, Neighbors is the guy. Look at Tyreek Hill. What does he do? He runs downfield. He's an elite route runner. They target him. They let him make plays. They give him chances. Daniel Jones, I want to see him. Look, 
I'm okay with him throwing some interceptions if he takes risks trying to get the ball to one of his best playmakers in, in 1v1 coverage. You're playing man coverage against neighbors, throw that thing up and let him make a play. You know what I mean? Don't be scared to do that. That's what makes great quarterbacks great. They let their playmakers make a play. Sometimes I think Daniel Jones doesn't take the risks he needs to take. Instead, he either you know overthrows it or underthrows it or tries to go for the easy routes. And sometimes the easy routes are the worst ones because like those guys are going to be getting two or three yards. You're dumping it down. like You're hoping that this guy... Third and ten. How many times have we seen third and ten? Guy throws it two yards and is yet, and then they tackle him for you know well before the first down marker. You know those are those type of things. Like I want to see Daniel Jones be aggressive. Right, this is really his last chance to show what he can do before the Giants inevitably decide whether they're going to move on from him or not. Let leave it on the field, man. Like just take your chances, take your shots, be aggressive, try to take a step forward. No one complains about Josh Allen throwing interceptions because the guy freaking takes risks. He takes chances, and he's one of the best quarterbacks in football because he knows how to give his playmakers a chance to, um, you know, turn something positive. And I think that this is what the Giants need to do. I think that's what Brian Dable wants the offense to be. That's what he did in Buffalo. He said, Josh, man, I trust your instincts. If you see an opportunity, let it rip. I don't care about turnovers. We want explosive plays. The Giants cannot play um, the way that some, like Patrick Mahomes does because he's so efficient finding the ball. His route runners know exactly where he's going to be. They have impeccable chemistry. Um, Daniel Jones does not have that type of chemistry with anybody on this team, right? He's been too injured and too inconsistent. I do think that right now they just need to be aggressive, let the ball fly, let things come to them, and the Giants can try to uh, manufacture production based on that uh, kind of schematic. However, I do like the fact of like one, two reads. That's what Tua does. Gets the ball, gets it out, fires it out really fast. They have a very high-octane high octane offense. Why? Because they get the ball to their best players, and they let their best players do the work. Um, that's kind of where I see Dan the Giants needing to go. Get the ball to your best playmakers, take some risks to them, and then you're going to get the production that follows. You know, What are your thoughts on that in terms of how the Giants should operate? Well, I kind of want to build on that and mention that I think that one player in particular in this Giants offense is going to experience a real breakout this season if Brian Dable is calling the plays. And let me break it down for you. If you remember last offseason when the Giants drafted Jalen Hyatt, who made the phone call? Who called to trade up and get Jalen Hyatt? It was Brian Dable. He saw Hyatt falling down the board. He called Sean McVay and said, hey, I want to trade up with you. The Los Angeles Rams made the deal and got Jalen Hyatt for his offense. And Jalen Hyatt wasn't super involved in the offense have to imagine that Brian Dable feeling convicted enough to trade up himself and, dra and draft Jalen Hyatt probably didn't feel so good about the fact that Mike Kafka barely utilized him. That offense was very conservative last season. Think about Brian Dable's entire career, whether you're talking OC with the Bills or that first season where he was the head coach with the Giants. When has he ever been conservative? That's not Brian Dable. He is an aggressive player or play caller. He is an aggressive head coach and an aggressive coordinator. The, the reason the Giants offense was so conservative last season, sure, injuries, lack of offensive line play, bad personnel on the field, but also it had to be in part due to the fact that Mike Kafka was calling the offense. Brian Dable is aggressive, likes to take deep shots, likes to put players in position to make big time explosive plays. Every offense that he's ever had up until last season, very explosive. So when I'm looking at this offense and I'm thinking about the ways that they can create quick passing opportunities, big plays, I'm looking at Jalen Hyatt to take a massive step forward in 2024 just based on the fact that Brian Dable loves Hyatt, was convicted enough to trade up and draft him, and is probably going to run an offense this season that caters towards Jalen Hyatt's strengths, which happen to be similar to the strengths of Malik Neighbors. So like you said, that one-two punch creating that almost Miami Dolphins-esque offense where you get the ball out quick into the hands of these speedy playmakers. Neighbors has all of the run after the catch ability in the world, and then you have Hyatt who's just throw it as deep as you can and let him run underneath it and make a big time play. Brian Dable loves playmakers just like that. And I think that Jalen Hyatt, again, because Dable was so adamant that he needed this guy on his team, and because Dable probably wanted the ball in the hands of Hyatt a little bit more last season, I think that if he takes over as the play caller this year, you're going to see a lot of deep shots downfield, and a lot of them are going to go to Jalen Hyatt, especially considering Darius Slayton, in the final year of his contract, seemingly a little bit unhappy with the way that that was resolved. Probably not here past the 2024 season. I imagine the Giants are going to want to get a good look at Jalen Hyatt, give him more opportunities, and see how much he can handle and hopefully develop him into a high-quality starter. So, Alex, I do want to get your take on that, just kind of my line of thinking here where Brian Dable was the one that made the trade. He wanted Jalen Hyatt. He wanted him to be a big part of the offense. He wasn't a big part of the offense last year. But if Brian Dable is calling the plays... 
I have to imagine we are in store for a Jalen Hyatt breakout. Look, for me, it really comes down to the offensive line, right? Jalen Hyatt's kind of a one-trick pony right now, unless he develops his route tree exponentially over the next couple of months. Um, yet to be seen, he definitely could have worked really hard this offseason and done just that. But he is a downfield threat. He is going to replace Darius Slayton, in my opinion, next year, uh, in 2025. When Slayton's contract ends, I think Slayton goes and walks away. And I think the Giants end up replacing him with Jalen Hyde, who they will have invested two years of development. Um, If the offensive line can play at an average level, which would be an astronomical increase compared to recent seasons, Jalen Hyde is going to benefit a lot. Why? Because Daniel Jones will have the extra second to wait for him to get open. Um, Unfortunately... When you're when you're kind of under duress instantly, you're trying to throw the ball up and you're not able to read the secondary well. You're not able to see that safety. Where is he biting? You're not able to look off the safety. You don't have as much time to do that. Um, he was trying to throw, or at least whoever was playing quarterback, was trying to throw the ball up and let our guys run underneath of it, which is a good idea, obviously. But if that safety has time to get there, you're going to see a lot more interceptions and pass breakups. So I think that with an extra second, you, your quarterback is able to look off the safeties, move them in the direction you want them to, and having neighbors is going to be a really nice benefit because Neighbors is going to be such a commander of attention. Those safeties are going to be having their eye on him at all times. Guys like Jalen Hyatt are going to be open. They're going to be in man coverage. Um, At least if you're playing like cover three, you're going to be able to run past those guys. So I I do think that hugging the boundary, utilizing that space, um, Jalen Hyatt should get a lot more options. Um, I do want to see them get him more involved on the crossing concepts too. Uh, He was really, really good. Him and Slayton are both excellent uh, when it comes to crossing concepts because you're talking about like straight line speed. He had a couple drops last year that were a little bit like, okay, like, you know, got to hold on to those. But, um, you know, if you haul those in, get a, a bit more efficient with that. I see him being kind of like um, a crossing and and nine route kind of specialist. That's what he is right now. I wonder how he develops his route tree. Uh, Is there anything that you kind of see there? Like, I want Darius Slayton, or rather Jalen Hyatt, to take a step forward in these route concepts. You think that there are other ways that they're going to try to get him more involved? I think that there are other ways that they're going to try and get him involved. And I, I think to kind of the point that I was originally making, a lot of the lack of usage for J- Jalen Hyatt last season was because of how conservative the offense was under Mike Kafka. And I think that there are more aggressive ways to get the ball in the hands of Jalen Hyatt. And it doesn't have to just be running a go route or running a deep route or uh, running deep crossers. There are other ways that you can get him the football. He wasn't just running pass or routes 50 yards down field during his time at Tennessee. I mean, the guy was a Bolitnikoff award winner, meaning he was the best wide receiver in the nation in 2022. He didn't do that just from running go routes. Now, yes, he ran a lot of go routes. He ran a lot of deep concepts, and they were really effective for him. But he didn't really even run that many of them last season. So even putting him on the field to run more nine rounds and run more plays downfield, listen, some of the impact that a receiver can make and what makes him so special, a defense has to respect Jalen Hyatt's abilities. So when he's running that deep post down the middle of the field, well, guess what? The shallow uh, in route is going to be more open for Malik Neighbors across the middle of the field. So there are ways that his talents can be utilized, not just in getting the ball in his hands, but in getting the ball in the hands of other playmakers now that the Giants have other playmakers like Malik Neighbors. So Hyatt's going to play an important role in that facet, but also he doesn't have to just run straight to get the football. You can have him run some curls. Any decent NFL receiver can run a 10-yard curl route. You can do that with Jalen Hyatt. He can catch the ball, and then if he breaks a tackle, his speed up the sideline, gone. So that's what you're hoping for. And it doesn't have to be deep crossers for Hyatt necessarily. Shallow crossers, he caught a few of those last year, turned those into first downs. He's got enough speed where you just want to get him into open space. So whether you're getting him open space downfield or open space short field, you're getting him the ball and you're putting it in his hands and letting him get his speed to work. So Jalen Hyatt, like I said, I think he's the big breakout candidate in this offense based on Brian Dable taking over as a play caller and wanting to be more aggressive and get the ball into the hands of the speedier options on this offense. But in addition to that, I do want to kind of ask you, Alex, how you think that Brian Dable taking over the play caller would augment the Giants' rushing attack? Do you think that it would change how frequently they're running the football, what kind of rushing concept they're, concepts they're utilizing? How do you think the Giants' rushing attack might or might not be affected by Brian Dable potentially taking over as the play caller? Um, when it comes to the running game, you know, the league has gone a direction where it's obviously more pass heavy, but I do think the running game is still an essential part, an essential piece of the equation. Saquon Barkley's departure is not 
a good thing, but it's also not the worst thing because the Giants were way too reliant on him, right? Like he, when you rely on the running back position, you are setting up to fail. Why? Because it's the most injury prone position. So the second you lose your star running back, you're freaking cooked, um, which is what the Giants routinely learned over the last four years. Um, so, you know, with that being said, obviously it's great to have a luxury item in Saquon Barkley or Christian McCaffrey, but it's the last piece of the puzzle. Saquon Barkley is the last piece of the puzzle, not a building block. And that's, you can say the same thing for every single great running back. Like Jam- Jameer Gibbs, everyone was like, why the hell did they do that? Well, he was the last piece of the puzzle for that Lions offense. Um, Christian McCaffrey, they acquired him from the Panthers, last piece of the puzzle for the San Francisco 49ers. Um, the Chiefs managed to get ridiculous value from anyone they draft because their offense is so freaking good and their scheming is so good. Isaiah Pacheco being the latest um, benefactor of that. Um, but you look at other teams like the Ravens with Derek with Derek Henry, last piece of the puzzle. They already have an elite defense. Uh, that you know, this is kind of what I'm trying to get uh, get across right now is that the Giants do not need a star running back. They are so far from needing the last you know piece of the puzzle, uh, which is why they took that money and invested it in other places, right? reinvesting in the defensive line, offensive line, uh, receiver core, whatever it might be. So the running game, I think, is going to be a little bit different, but it's not going to be bad. Devin Singletary is a very decent running back. Guys, like, don't underrate how Dev- good Devin Singletary is. He's not going to be Saquon Barkley blockbuster good, but that's why you have Malik Neighbors. You know what I mean? You have him to do all the blockbuster plays, not Saquon. So uh, I do think that Singletary is a very good one-cut, get-up field type of running back. He's decent in pass protection. He's a decent receiver. I think Tyrone Tracy wins that RB2 job. Personally, I think he's going to be a really solid player for us can do a lot for you on third downs and you know do a lot in the open fields i think this is going to be one of the weaker running back groups we've had just because you don't have saquon but it's not a bad thing because it puts more emphasis on the passing game which is where the giants should be trending anyway brian dable didn't build his career running the football with the buffalo bills he built his career passing the football with josh allen um so i do think that that's where they're going to go you know keep in mind devin singletary was there when he was a buffalo bill and they had one of the best offenses in football so you know apples to apples not really (laughs) because you don't have josh allen um but you had zach moss too over there like you know they had a couple of good players but um we got the running backs coach from saint uh, from new orleans who helped develop alvin kamara so whatever he saw in tyrone tracy maybe there's something there right kamara is obviously better but tracy is a very low workload and i do like that his his legs are fresh he's going to come in and make an instant impact in that way yeah, and his playing style is similar to what was utilized so heavily with the Alan Kamara playing style in New Orleans. So you have to imagine the new running backs coach, I want to say his name is Joel something, Joel something, uh, forgetting what his last name is. The new running backs coach, though, loves to get the ball into the hands of the running backs as receivers in that Alvin Kamara role. And considering Tyrone Tracy, formerly a wide receiver, converted to running back, very similar playing style, different talent level, but similar playing style to Alvin Kamara. You have to imagine he could end up playing a pretty big role for this team, even though they signed Devin Singletary to that three-year contract. And Singletary, as you mentioned, great player that Brian Dable has familiarity with. So I think there are so many pros to Brian Dable potentially taking over as a play caller. But Alex, as we kind of move into the final stages of this conversation, I want to ask you about a potential con that some viewers might bring up, which is, would this mean too big of a workload for Brian Dable? Can he handle calling the plays and managing the team as the head coach? A lot of fans prefer the head coach just be the head coach, not the OC plus the head coach, not the play caller plus the head coach. How do you feel about that? Because me personally, I'll say, I think most of the best head coaches in the NFL, name a whole bunch of them, they usually call plays. You want to talk about head coaches like Sean McVay, offensive mastermind and guru? He calls plays. Kyle Shanahan for the San Francisco 49ers, he calls plays. Keep coming up with different examples, and I'm sure many of them do call plays. And I know that not all of them do, but a lot of them do. So if you want to find out whether or not Brian Dable is a great head coach that's supposed to be here long term, I think he needs to call plays this season. If he can prove to be a good head coach plus play caller, one of those Sean McVay-esque coaches, then you know you have your answer at the head coaching position and you do want to continue to invest in Brian Dable and build the team how he wants it built and make him your future of this organization. So uh, that's kind of how I feel, but I know that there are some fans that feel like clock management and other things could become a problem if Brian Dable takes over as the play caller. Alex, how do you feel about that? Do you think that would be too big of a workload for him? Or do you think that, like me, giving him that kind of Sean McVay control over the team plus really controlling his offense is probably the best way to go? Um, you know, I do get worried because we have seen issues with clock management in the past and some like discipline stuff, um, you know, too many players on the field, like just stupid things that just cannot happen. Um, I think a quality control coach, you know, would be advisable for Brian Dable if he's going to take over that responsibility or at the very least Mike Kafka needs to be, I think this actually would be, you know, now that I think of it, 
Maybe you just don't need a quality control coach. Maybe you just have Mike Kafka help you in those ways. If he's not calling plays, dude's got a lot of freaking time on his hands to do absolutely nothing because um, he's not operating in that regard. So he's helping devise the plays, helping you know feed information in Brian Dable's ear. But to be quite honest with you, based on what we've heard and the news, we, you know, the kind of the narratives that have been spun, it doesn't seem like Brian Dable is going to be listening to him that much. It seems like he's going to be kind of doing what he wants to do and running his offense. Not Mike Kafka's offense, but his offense. They'll have a you know, game plan. Maybe Mike Kafka will say, these are the plays I like. He'll pick one of them. I don't know how it's going to operate, but I think Brian Dable has a good touch for the game and the flow of the game, and he knows when to do things. And I think he's going to use his instincts and gut to make those decisions. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had Kafka say, well, you were just kind of in line for a head coaching job. Do you want a head coaching job? Get more involved in being an assistant head coach. You know what I mean? Like, didn't they didn't they upgrade him to something like that too? So it kind of makes the sense. Head coach now, yes. So it makes sense for him to be like helping in terms of all of those different quality control stuff. So I could see him falling into more of that role than being like the guy in in Dable's ear, if that makes sense. It does make sense, and I, I like where you're coming from with that. But I will also mention that the Giants do have a quality control coach. Um, it's just there were some conversations last year from that Pat Leonard article, for example, where Brian Dable was kind of receiving. Uh, kind of like his quality control coach was kind of telling him like, hey, let's do this. And Brian Dable was kind of ignoring him is what that article made it seem like. Like Dable didn't really take the quality control coach's points into much account. Um, So obviously that's something that he needs to improve on. And he said that he plans to and is going to try his best to. Um, But I do agree with you in the sense that if, if Mike Kafka is not calling the plays, there is still a lot for an offensive coordinator slash assistant head coach to do outside of calling plays. Uh, And again, all signs point to Brian Dable calling the plays. I think this is a great idea. Like you said at the top of the episode, if he's going to go down, he better go down swinging. Uh, Totally in agreement with you on that one. And I think that the ceiling of this team increases exponentially with Brian Dable taking over as the play caller. And that's what we need. We need a higher ceiling. The floor is lower than ever for this Giants team, but the ceiling isn't very high. Whatever we can do to increase the ceiling of this team and improve our potential win-loss potential, uh, you know, how high we can reach with that, if Brian Dable gives us the best chance to sneak out a couple more wins based on his ballsy, aggressive play-calling style, then F it, man. Give me Brian Dable as the play caller. I think this is exactly what the Giants need. I think when you look at Daniel Jones and how he kind of took to the teaching of Brian Dable in 2022, 2023, it seemed like Kafka took on a little bit more of the offense and things didn't really go as planned. Give Dable the keys, let him run his show how he wants to run it and uh, let him go down swinging. Like you said, I think that's exactly what I want to see from this Giants offense. So it'll be interesting, of course, as we get into mandatory minicamp, we'll hear more from Brian Dable about his plans for the play calling situation. We'll find out how many practices he calls as the play caller next week as well uh, during minicamp and we'll continue to update you on that and everything else surrounding the New York Giants right here on Fireside Giants. So make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you're listening to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, we'll catch you all on the next one. Have a good one and let's go Giants.